I want to welcome everybody to this breakout session. Um, this is about local and regional food in public sector institutions. And we were joking earlier about there's got to be a better name for institution. So that's something for us all to work on, I think. Um, and this is quite an interesting um, area. Uh, it's actually, from the local food point of view, this is the low-hanging fruit. Um, it really is, because this is where a lot of money gets spent. Tens of millions, in some cases even hundreds of millions, get spent through procurement for food. There's mouths to feed. So just think of any institution that has mouths to feed and they're buying food. Um, schools um, and hospitals primarily. And so that's what we've got represented here. A little bit of background, Center for Local Prosperity. We did two earlier conferences and coming out of the first one was the idea of local procurement. Um, that led us into a study that we did and you can see that study on our exhibit table. That then led us into uh, the most obvious place to start for local procurement um, was um, with institutions. So we then did a study on that and what is the economic benefit. So it's not just buying local food. We've learned that there's a multiplier effect anytime you're supporting local businesses. There's a two and a half times multiplier of economic activity within that community. So it tends to really uh, kind of multiply that way. So uh, it's fantastic that we've got a good representation here today. Um, we have Nancy Traguno, um, who's first, and just if you could say one minute about you, you're uh, filling in for Don Hare, who is on the agenda. So if you could take the mic and maybe just give us one minute about your background. Sure. So I'm Nancy Trigano. I work at Perennia Food and Agriculture, and I'm a food scientist. So we do um, a lot of work with value-added food products. Um, as a, another hat that I wear, I'm a volunteer um, with the Annapolis Valley Farm to School Committee. I'm the committee chair. And that is how I've gotten to know Don Hare over the past probably eight years. Um, and Don couldn't be here today because she has uh, an illness in the family. So she was very disappointed not to be here. And I'm going to be basically reading her talk. So forgive me for looking at the notes. Well, thank you, Nancy. Also, we've got Chetty Seth. She is a mother, farmer, researcher, and experiential educator from India, currently teaching with the Department of Community Development at Acadia University. Her research and practice center around healing and rebuilding relationships as a path towards sustainable food systems. She's been involved with systems level change at Acadia's institutional food system since 2015. Then we've got uh, Brenda McDonald, Senior Director for Nutrition and Health Services at the Nova Scotia Health Authority. She oversees clinical nutritional care, food services, healthy eating, and dietetic practicum internships in 43 facilities across Nova Scotia. She's part of the Nova Scotia Food and Nutrition Program Advisory Committee and the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force working to enhance sustainable food procurement by focusing on local food sourcing for public institutions. Andrea Penny is the manager of food services, business development, and commercial and retail operations at IWK Health. Andrea is registered, uh, a registered dietitian, a member of the Nova Scotia Food and Nutrition Program Advisory Committee, and passionate about local food. She's currently pushing the envelope at IWK to increase local, sustainable, and environmentally friendly food options and decreasing IWK's carbon footprint. And Morgan Palmer, a Red Seal chef and registered dietitian, currently working with the PEI Certified Organic Producers Cooperative, her cooking expertise is seasonal, local menu development, and has worked across the food service industry in hospitals, restaurants, and hotels. Most recently, she supported child care centers in menu development and policy adherence, and led to the development of a PEI-wide 
pay what you can school lunch program. So we'd like to get started and uh, Nancy, how about if you go first? Okay, so um, Don is wearing ver various hats and we're gonna talk about a few of them. On behalf of the Annapolis Valley Farm to School Committee, Farm to Cafeteria Canada, and Nourish Nova Scotia, which are three of her hats. Um, thank you to the organizers of this amazing event and to everybody for your interest in uh, getting local food into schools. Um, I just wanted to make a quick mention that yesterday Philip talked about how we are trying to rebuild our food system in one generation when it was undone in three generations. And I just was thinking this morning um, maybe it's important to mention that the fastest way forward when trying to skip all that time and do things in one generation is to work with kids. Um, so teaching our children the importance of healthy eating really does leapfrog us. So I'm just going to say that before I start to, to um, use Dawn's words here. Um, so we're going to talk about farm to school, and that's all about increasing opportunities for health, healthy local food in schools hands-on learning, as well as school and community connectedness. This can include farm-to-school snacks, school gardens, salad bars, farm-to-school fundraisers, farm-to-caterer to school, and hot lunch programs, which are all win-win-win scenarios. So for the presentation today, um, we're going to be talking about Dawn's three farm-to-school hats. So she's the snack coordinator, Farm to Cafeteria Canada Regional Lead for Nova Scotia, and she's also a parent volunteer at KCA, which is a school in Kentville. Um, we're going to talk about transitioning that school's contracted food service program to a PTA-run cafeteria and the great success that they've seen doing that. Their new, their new lunch program emphasizes healthy homemade meals vegetables and fruit, as well as seasonal local produce. So KCA, or Kings County Academy, is a P-8 to school in Kenville, Nova Scotia, in the heart of the Annapolis Valley. And we're very lucky, those of us who live in the Annapolis Valley, because we're surrounded by amazing local food. So our access is easier than it might be in other parts of the country or the province. So this case study showcases how this, small, this uh, school's small stepping stone initiatives over the years came together to create a bigger impact on school food culture and local food procurement. The key ingredients for this journey started with a keen school administration, years of concerned and vocal families, as well as programming that was already in place, um, including the farm to school snack program, and the Nourish Your Roots fundraiser. So we're, I'm just going to tell you briefly about those two programs. Farm to School Snack is a monthly universal free snack program that provides locally grown vegetables and fruit from Nova Scotia farms to students in participating schools. So the local produce is purchased by schools at fair market value, and then volunteers prepare and serve the snack to the students and staff in their classrooms or in the cafeteria during recess. And along with the snack, the students also get information sheets and they're you know, uh, suitable for different age groups. And the teachers can use those um, info sheets to talk about fun facts about the fruit or vegetable. And they can talk about how it's grown. They can talk about the biology of the plant. They can, there's a lot of different um, activities they can do around that item. Feedback from this program has been extremely positive, and a lot of students have peer pressure to try new things that they may not try at home, which is really exciting. Um, so far this year, the students have tried things like local blueberries, ground cherries, grape tomatoes, nectarines, pears, cauliflower, and bell peppers. So this snack program has a natural way of leading into other good things happening around food at the schools. Um, for example, um, they may try the raw bell pepper as a snack, and then they might have it in their stir fry at lunch. Um, and they may be picking things for their salad that they wouldn't normally pick because they've tried it in the classroom with their friends. The second program uh, mentioned is the Nourish Your Roots program. So for those who aren't familiar, 
This is a Nourish Nova Scotia program. Um, it's a farm to school fundraiser that provides an opportunity for participating schools in the province to sell boxes of local produce to support healthy eating initiatives at their schools. Uh, both programs were in place when KCA decided to make their leap um, transitioning from their food service, food service provider to a PTA run cafeteria. The final decision was sparked by families dissatisfied with the current situation, very few students were ordering lunches, and um, they decided to take the leap of faith because they had cooperation between administration and volunteers. That was the key ingredient. So first they had to end the arrangement with the local food service provider, which was not easy. Um, but they had interest from a Red Seal chef and commitment from a small group of parents and got through all those logistics. Big, big learning curves, uh, but they were now independently run and could make their own decisions about where to get food. So they got locally sourced food. A lot of it comes from um, Armstrong Food. And then other uh, local produce can come also from a distributor in the valley that, uh, that uh, delivers to the school. And that's a key thing. They don't have the time to run out and pick things up. So getting it delivered was a, a key ingredient. So I just wanted to, um, to briefly go over some of the tangible successes of this program. First of all, the number of meals ordered was 10 meals a day under the old program and now it's up to 200 to 300 meals per day. There's a rotating and varied menu selection. So they have like vegetarian, gluten-free, um, and other modifications available. Students are trying new foods, exploring new tastes and new cultures. Feedback from the families is overwhelmingly positive. There's a weekly salad bar option, which was added to enhance access to vegetables and fruits. And then the students get to choose what they put on their plate. It's created um, meaning and meaningful and valued job opportunities. So there's three employees now, and they're paid fair wages, including paid holidays, paid in-service days, and paid snow days, which was not the case before. The program ensures that every student has a lunch. I asked Don what the cost is. It's $4 per student, but if you don't pay, you still get to eat. And nobody knows who's paid and who hasn't paid. So a student can go up and order lunch, and nobody knows if they weren't able to pay. It's one of the only cafeterias in the region not uh, on the old system. And finally, the program has the ability to procure the seasonal local produce, which makes it extra special. Um, as a final note, with KCA being one of two schools in Nova Scotia that received a Farm to Cafeteria Canada grant, the school is now working on advancing their Farm to School initiatives a little bit further. So they are going to start an after-school cooking club, field trips to local farms and gardens, microgreen growing kits, hydroponic towers to grow produce for the cafeteria's salad bar, which is connected to the middle school curriculum, new partnerships with local farms and gardens, and new freezer space to store seasonal produce. They're also looking at a new system to track the purchase and use of local pr produce and ingredients. So there was a genuine desire to make this happen. It's been a real success, and it shows it is possible to create significant change in school food serving healthy and delicious meals, sourcing local, and paying fair wages to kitchen staff. Everyone's been invested, and I think that it's uh, a really exciting story and hopefully a great example for other schools to follow. Thank you very much for your interest in Farm to School. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> so I want everybody to hold your questions to the very end, so remember what they are. Um, and we're going to graduate here from the school system up to the university system and turn it over to Chetty. That was pretty quick, eh? <laughs> um, so I teach, as, as Bob said, I teach at Acadia University um, in community development, and thank you for having me. Um, and I've been involved with the process of trying to shift the institutional food system at Acadia towards more healthy, more local, and more sustainably produced food for the last eight years or so and in a number of different positions. So I've worked as a research assistant, as a graduate student, as a community member who really cares about food systems, and now as a faculty member. Um, and some of the ways in which I'm 
involved in that work is that I serve on the Acadia Food Services Advisory Committee. I see another member in the back there, Leslie, um, which is a committee that consists of students, staff, faculty, and administration. And we work really closely with our external food, pro our corporate food service provider. Um, I helped write the Acadia Food Policy, uh, and I was also part of shaping the last request for proposal that went out that's led to the current contract that we're in now, um, which began in 2020. Um, and, we, and I served on the RFP evaluation committee that led to the, the, per, the company that's in, the current, in that position now. So that's some of the ways in which I've been involved. Um, one of my areas of research is also studying this process of change to say what can we learn from it that might be applicable to other folks. So I'm kind of bringing both the practical and the theoretical pieces as I speak today. Um, and so one of the things that my research really pointed out was that even though this process looks very different in different institutions, and you know, we just heard of some amazing examples, um, there are some key stages that, that may be important to that process. And the three kind of stages that I identified were reframing the conversation, uh, building a collective vision, and then a strategic implementation of that vision. And so the reframing the conversation part is really, which I think this, you know, the way that this conference is holding um, our, our ideas around food, really recognizing that food isn't simply, or food services isn't simply about putting food on the table, which it can become sometimes, it's a logistical piece. Um, but recognizing that food is you know, core to people's well-being, it's core to our sense of belonging, it's core to how we gather and connect with each other. It's a way that institutions can make a contribution and be connected with their communities and economies. And so really being able to talk about food in this multifaceted way, and not just a few people, but actually across the institution having conversations around food in this way was, was one of the key ingredients that led to being able to make change. Uh, building a collective vision, so really, again, you know, across the institution, having folks who had a vision for what we wanted food services to be like. And as I do my research, it's actually incredible how many institutions don't have a food policy or a food vision, right? And so that, that needs to be clear. We need to know what we're working towards. Um, and then finally, figuring out how we can strategically implement this vision, because it's often limited resources and a lot of systemic barriers. So what are the strategic leverage points? Um, and one of the key things for that for us was really using a systems approach and kind of looking at the whole system. Um, in, in these phases, um, we found that it's really important to recognize that there's power dynamics in any institution and that that's something we have to contend with in this work. And so most of our institutions are organized in pyramids um, and those people who are eating, so who are most impacted by and most connected with the food system are often at the bottom of that pyramid. So a lot of number, but often not in a place where you're in a decision-making capacity. <laughs> Whereas folks who are at the top may have a lot of, you know, hold a lot of power and authority, but aren't necessarily as connected to the food system or the eaters. And so one of the things that my research showed was that all of these different stakeholder groups actually have a lot of potential to make change, but it needs to be leveraged. And the other reason it needs to be leveraged is that it's often not any one person's job in the institution to do this work, right? So we're hearing about volunteers, are like all these creative ways that people are trying to make change. And so if, in order to make this happen successfully, we do need to leverage the potential that all the stakeholders have. And what that really requires is a collaborative leadership approach. Um, so for, in practical terms, what that can look like, um, for example, in our case, is this joint committee where we have, you know, we have students, we have faculty, we have staff, we have administrators. But it also requires a commitment from at least some folks within that committee to make sure that the voices that have the least amount of structural power are centered and heard because, of course, power dynamics. You know, not having everyone around the table doesn't mean that everyone's concerns are heard equally. So in our case, that was really uplifting student voices, um, but also producers who weren't at the table, but making sure that we were bringing those perspectives in regularly. Um, yeah, and then the final piece of it is, is strategic implementation. So I'll talk about a few things that have really been foundational to our work that have allowed some of these shifts to happen. One is having a food policy document, so coming back to that idea of having a collective vision. And it needs to be something that represents, so we had a lot of consultation, we had several years of consultation with all of these different stakeholder groups, so that the vision wasn't just something that came out of the heads of 10 people sitting around a table, but that people saw themselves represented in it. Um, so I'll just read out yeah, um, and the other piece about this policy is that it has to have both the pieces. So this is also the systems approach where it has to have the broad vision of like, here's what we're aiming for, but then it also has to go into the more specific, like the nitty gritty of like, what are the specific target areas? What are our progress indicators? How will we know? And so having a balance of both. So our vision, for example, is Acadia University cultivates a nourishing, enjoyable, and accessible campus food system that supports learning, celebrates diversity, contributes to the local economy, protects the environment, builds community, and promotes health. Now that's, you know, that's a lot, and it's pretty high level, but it does identify clearly what the campus community cares about in relation to food. 
But then the specific target indicators that we have, and I'll just name a couple of examples. Obviously, there's a whole long, a whole long world of it. One is that we require that our food service provider has at least a minimum of 20% going into local food and go increasing up to 50% so that by the end of the contract, we should be spending half of the money that's getting spent, all those millions of dollars that you talked about, half of that should be going back into the local economy. Another one uh, is that 20% increasing to 50% of meat products have to come from um, producers that meet one of a range of animal welfare certifications that we've identified as meeting, meeting our criteria. One other piece that I think is really important is organizational capacity. And so again, there's, it's often not any one person's job and we found that we need capacity on both ends. So one of our asks in our RFP was for the food service provider to, to create some organizational capacity. So we have a nutrition and sustainability position that was created so that it is actually someone's job to do all of the work that is required. This takes time, it takes effort, particularly in the beginning to shift policies, to build relationships with producers, to really look at the data, to create menu changes. Like all of this, often one of the reasons it gets stalled, we found, was when there isn't someone to kind of hold this. Um, and similarly on our end, uh, on the institutions end, we also need someone whose mandate this actually is to be able to, you know, who's, who, where it's part of your job description. Um, it's definitely still a challenge, I would say, on, on the institution end. Um, recognizing that many of the barriers are structural and so that we need structural and policy changes uh, to support local procurement. So one example um, is that when I, when I first started this work, our food service provider had a requirement that all of our meat had to be federally inspected. Um, and often the reason given for this is that it's a food safety concern, and so I actually spent a lot of time <laughs> reading the, you know, the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the 40 pages of the you know, Provincial Meat Inspection Act and talking to the Provincial Meat Inspector and talking to folks from CFIA and eventually realizing, which I see some nodding heads, that um, in our case, the Provincial Meat Inspection regulations are actually more stringent than the federal ones, and so it's not a field food safety issue. But because it was a policy at the corporate level, it still took two years of persistence and conversations and bringing a lot of evidence and connecting with other institutions for that policy to change. Um, but we, we now can. So we now can buy provincially meat, uh, inspected meat and because we have some incredible meat producers in Nova Scotia who work on a small scale who use more humane practices, um, you know, we can access that. And, that's, um, and one of the advantages, of course, is that now that policy has changed at a corporate level so anybody working with our food service provider can also access that, right? So the scale can be a barrier but the scale can also be leveraged. Um, I think it was really important for us to create avenues to work with small scale producers. So again, the structural barriers recognizing that many of the ways that the systems are set up at an institution level are, are, an, are a, a hindrance for small scale producers. It just doesn't work. Um, and so one of our asks in the RFP was that our food service provider actually create different avenues for, for allowing access for small scale local producers. And so this includes things, it's called the bi-local program in our case, and it includes things like uh, shorter payment cycles, so producers aren't waiting six months to get paid, which is untenable. Um, you can get paid more quickly, delivery options that work, the possibility of the food service provider actually going out and doing inspection instead of requiring third-party certification. This is still, it's not easy, but at least it's starting to open the conversation um, that some of those certifications just aren't in, made for, for a different scale of producer. Um, and then delivery options that work and not requiring a producer to have to supply enough that it has to meet all of the food service provider's accounts um, quantities, which, which, can, which sometimes can be a requirement. Um, so this, this kind of like creating a channel with has specific you know, structural changes that allow us to work with local producers has been the basis of many existing producer relationships at Acadia now. And we're currently in the process of a really exciting partnering with the Wolf of Farmers Market, which is working as an aggregator to, to continue to build that um, access to local and sustainable food. Um, and then I'll speak to one more. Am I okay for another minute? Sure. But if I'm out, I can stop now too. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so the final one is just recognizing that price often comes up as an issue and so that we had to find ways to create a little bit more leverage in terms of, you know, the access and the budget and we found that plant-based options really meet that or allow us to create some leverage. It's also something students are asking for. More students are vegetarian, vegan, looking for plant-based options, um, animal welfare concerns, but also that when we're replacing meat products with plant-based products, that then creates a bit of room in the budget for us to invest in these more local products or higher quality products. Products. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Jetty. Yes. And Brenda, please go ahead. Great, thank you. 
Um, so our journey toward local food really in started with us wanting to better nourish our patients within Nova Scotia Health Hospitals. So we have 43 hospitals across the province, um, and we know that there's lots of malnutrition in our communities. The um, Canadian Malnutrition Task Force did lots of surveys across Canada, including Nova Scotia, and for, unfortunately, 45% of patients who come into hospital from community are malnourished. So we know our food system within hospitals needed to change in order to help people get better to go home. So over the past few years, we've been changing our food service system within our bigger hospitals to an enhanced room service model. So our system used to be that uh, patients would get a menu and they would fill it out, what they would like based on two choices, but they would get this menu three days before they had to pick, <laughs> had to eat. So then, they, of course, who remembers what they ate three days ago? Certainly not me. So why would someone in hospital who wasn't feeling well um, really remember? So we've modified um, the Halifax Infirmary, Dartmouth General, VG. That's where we were starting with an enhanced room service model, um, which provides a restaurant-style menu to our patients. And the patients get to either call us 45 minutes before uh, they'd like to eat and tell us what they'd like to meet, to eat, or um, not every patient is well enough to pick up the phone. So we also have team members who go visit with little iPads and take patients' orders as well at the bedside. So with those, um, those mediums to get folks to put their orders in, we have seen a great increase in patients' um, ability to eat more. Our waste used to be around 36%, I'm sad to say, of what was on the tray, and now we're down to 13%. So we know we are better nourishing um, patients, but we still have lots and lots of uh, work to do. So I tell you that story because the menu is, of course, the blueprint of how we get local food into our hospitals. And so with a restaurant-style menu, we, it is very agile compared to our old former menu. So we can change a restaurant-style menu, just like the restaurants do it, um, very quickly based on what's available and what's not available. So how does local fit? Of course, local fits in because we built the menu based on what we could get in Nova Scotia, including those mashed potatoes that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes <laughs> that we heard of in the last session. Um, our goal is to, of course, start with greater than 20% of local. So we have achieved that goal. So 20%, 24% actually of what comes into Nova Scotia Health our local Nova Scotia products. It took us a lot of work to get there, um, and we're not done. We'd like it to be 90% if it could be. So that is our, over the next couple of years, we're going to continue to work with uh, our partners across uh, Nova Scotia and the Atlantic provinces to increase that local. So we measure everything. Um, I think my team is ready to tell me to stop measuring everything. So we measure waste, we measure patient satisfaction, we measure how much healthy food we have, and of course we measure our local food spend every month. And so that's, and that has really leveraged us to go to our senior leadership to get support for local food. So, and now they're really anxious and we have to report on it now every month and we, uh, we have a KPI. So you, you kind of build the environment of what you want um, your folks above you to want from you. And so it's, it's been wonderful to have their support. And um, so I'll tell you our little story about our local um, potatoes that we heard a little bit from Heather in the last session. So our, our, in Nova Scotia, we love our potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and that is one thing on the menu. And although we are increasing our diversity in our menu, people, when they're in the hospital, they still want certain things and comfort food and soup and homemade food. Um, and mashed potatoes is one of those. So that was a really big um, food spend that we had. So we met with and chatted to the Station Food Hub and tried to determine how can we get local mashed potatoes. That was value add. So we have 43 kitchens, and it's really hard to get staffing in rural Nova Scotia and Canso and McNeil's Harbor and all those places. So we really wanted a really good value base. So we wanted the mashed potatoes to come in. 
ready for us, so we didn't want to have peeled, or we didn't want to have to buy potatoes that we had to peel because we really put our labor for our patients. We make all the food fresh to order, so we wanted to make stir fries and we wanted to make, you know, cook the chicken fresh and whatnot. So if we could get potatoes that were value added and mashed, we knew that that would be as long as they taste really good, like Christmas potatoes, I like to call them. Um, so. Um, so we met for at least a year, every two weeks um, with Station Food Hub. We went to the farm, we saw the potatoes, um, we I helped in the design of the kitchen. We wanted to make sure it met all those standards that we just talked about from a food safety standard. So it's really a story, I would say, of partnerships. Um, partnerships are key when you're trying to increase your local food. I'm not going to grow potatoes uh, on my own, so um, we want to give a shout out to GFS, Gordon Food Services, and the Station Food Hub because they've been really great partners to come to the table, no pun intended, um, with us in order to really increase and give us access to those mashed potatoes. And we, we rolled out slow. We changed the recipe a couple of times. I'm looking at Rebecca, who, who knows the pain. And we ha it was even down to the packaging, what kind of packaging would really work that would make, sh make sure that it would travel well and get to all and meet all the food safety standards as well. So we started last December after meeting every two weeks. We're still meeting, by the way, talking about other things now. Um, and we have purchased about 80,000 pounds of mashed potatoes since last December. So we're now working on carrots. <laughs> and maybe, so that's it for me. Thank you. And Andrea, go ahead. Great. <clears throat> it's been a while since I've uh, held a microphone, so... <laughs> Um, so thank you so much, Brenda, and the Station Food Hub for actually setting that up because I'm fortunate that the IWK has been able to uh, purchase those potatoes as well. Um, so I work at the IWK. I manage the food services department for both retail and patient operations. And um, so I'm going to talk about just a few successes that we've had and as well give you two takeaways, which uh, might seem quite simple but are really so key that I think you know, our partners here have really touched on as well. So one is to take risks. I know that seems so simple, um, but I don't think anyone would be here if we didn't take a risk or have an idea and just get excited to, you know, talk about food and uh, talk about where it comes from and, and it being local and, you know, seeking those opportunities, raising your hand, being the first one to do a pilot. <laughs> I know, I think someone spoke yesterday about joining a focus group, so I'm gonna put my hand up for that as well. Um, and two would be collaboration. The two really go hand in hand with taking risk and, and collaborating. Um, you're not gonna be able to do anything if you're working in a silo, so that's been really important for us as well. So, um, at the IWK, we started out simple. Uh, we worked with Noggins Corner Farm to introduce a once a week farmer's market at Halifax. So bringing uh, a little piece of the valley to Halifax. Um, we did that in our cafeteria over the lunch hour, which was really successful for us. Um, so it really built that relationship with the farmer and the customer, built a lot of community, built a lot of conversation. Um, staff would come down, they would get their groceries, they'd be more apt to try something new because there's typically a lot of more variety. Um, and also our patient families would come down and they'd wondered, why is there a produce stand in the middle of the cafeteria? Um, and so that was quite exciting for them to learn a few things about food, where it comes from. And uh, yeah, so that was one initiative that we worked on. And as well, um, after that, we had an urban garden on site. Uh, I don't have a green thumb yet. I am working on it. So we... Uh, we worked with a local gardener who brought in transplants and uh, we were able to take the crops um, and put them on our salad bar. So we would literally pluck the grape tomatoes right off the vine and uh, put them on our salad bar and just walk two minutes. So it doesn't get more local than that and uh, really reduce those food miles as well. And then partnering with as Brenda mentioned, GFS, they are our provincial distributor. Uh, and we also both work and uh, collaborate on the provincial advisory committee for the food and nutrition program. Um, so they offered a pilot, a local food pilot, which I did raise my hand. I said, yes, I wanna go first. 
I think Nova Scotia helped it too. <laughs> um, so what they did is they've been able to provide us with some really great data and determine how much are we currently spending on local products. So first from Nova Scotia and then the rest of the Maritimes um, to give us a baseline in terms of what we're working with. And as well, they were able to look at our patient menu and say, okay, these are the products I think you can switch over to a local vendor. And then they also asked us, you know, what are your needs? And they went out and kind of did the work for us, to be honest, um, and sourced those products and those partnerships for us. And also took out the piece where they are our distributor, so we can already put those products right on our weekly orders. Um, and they also take care of the recall product, or the process for us, sorry, um, which is a big safeguard for us in a in healthcare center. So yeah, my two takeaways. Um, one, definitely take risks, put your hand up, and uh, two, always collaborate, network, which is why we're here today. And I think the last time we tracked our local food, we were at about 23%, which is Nova Scotia and Maritimes. And we know that beyond those contracts, we've also partnered with Just Us and uh, made with local, so we know it's a little bit higher than that as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Morgan. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm kind of stepping back, I guess. I don't necessarily have a best practice. We're doing more so than the research, or the research end in Prince Edward Island. So I'm working with the PEI uh, Certified Organic Producers uh, Cooperative. And so we're kind of doing more institutional procurement research um, as part of this project. So as in uh, every other province and territory, the institutional market on PEI represents large market share. And it's currently completely untapped by PEI organic producers. Um, we, in the past, the primary challenge has been a kind of a collective distribution model for aggregation of small farms. Um, but we have that model now in place, a grower station. And Diane Gonzalez is going to talk about that tomorrow. So I won't talk too much about it. But now that we have it, we're interested in looking at that replacement of imported foods with local organic um, products and, and trying to quantify or qualify the social, environmental, and economic impacts. Um, we're also attempting to quantify the impacts on carbon emissions, um, rural economies, and food security. So just a little tiny project for this winter. Um, so Bob asked me to talk about more on the supply and the demand side, um, not necessarily on the procurement, which isn't really my specialty anyway. So from the supply end, you know, from a farmer's perspective, it's really all about grower station. And, and it was developed because our farmers did approach um, you know, the, the uh, distribution models or businesses that provide to institutions, and they were turned down for, for various reasons, usually around pricing. So the grower station was essentially developed so that the profits would stay on farm, and they operated a nonprofit uh, in, in a nonprofit business model so that they don't have to have a huge markup and uh, the prices can be competitive. So hence this uh, research project. Um, in addition to that, we, because Grower Station exists, you know, we have the potential to take on kind of the red tape and getting into institutions like the certifications and the tender process and all that kind of fun stuff. So that's from the supply perspective. And then from the demand perspective, Bob asked me to talk a little bit about, you know, what does it even look like inside these institutions? Um, like I said, I have a cooking background, so I find that piece really interesting. And we do tend to lump all institutional procurement or cooking together, but the reality is, is that they're very different needs depending largely on who's eating and who's cooking. So I thought that I would compare two very different uh, settings, and one <laughs> was talked about a little bit with hospitals, but the hospitals in Prince Edward Island are, like everything else, about a decade behind the rest of the, uh, the country. And so, and that, but then I also thought I'd talk about childcare centers, which nobody's discussed yet. Um, so child cancer, child care centers in BEI are all run by private businesses, but a large majority of them and the more, um, the majority of children do attend, um, earlier centers, which are designated, uh, centers, uh, that are pretty highly subsidized by the province. So I think that they do matter in terms of institutional procurement. And these centers are, are, uh, you know, dictated to provide a meal and, and two snacks to full-time attendees. So that represents almost five, 540,000 meals a year. So nothing to sneeze at, even though they are pretty tiny portions. 
Um, <laughs> each center hires a cook, which is typically, you know, they're pretty well trained in terms of like a culinary or super, um, diploma, but they're not necessarily Red Seal certified. They often only work part time and they feed about 50 kids a day and often substitute when, you know, other childcare providers are, you know, do whatever it is that they need to do in the run of a day to manage uh, those little monsters. <laughs> um, earlier centers are often in converted single family homes with home style kitchens, no industrial kitchen equipment, and, uh, but they do cook everything from scratch typically. Um, food procurement policy and methods is really just depend on the individual business and there's no, you know, there's no real um, policy put out. Typically groceries are purchased at full retail costs at grocery stores and food purchases are just driven by the lowest price. So they kind of shop the sales, but they're purchasing retail, which blows my mind. <laughs> um, earlier centers must follow the, the healthy living guidelines, which reflect Canada's food guide and encourages use of local food, but like many other policies, it's not enforced. Um, and they're supported by early learning coaches um, in following these guidelines, but it's mostly you know, centered around education and these, these coaches aren't necessarily uh, have a food related background. So sometimes the menus kind of you know, fall to the wayside. Um, and so the menus vary widely among the centers and it's ultimately up to the cook or the director and their interest in nutrition and local food. Um, but earlier centers are a really interesting model because they you know, the whole idea of feeding children and the division of responsibility and the, the foods that we need to provide our children to, for them to be exposed to and uh, the way that they become more acceptable to foods when they know where it's coming from. Uh, it's quite an interesting model in terms of institutional procurement. In addition, the earlier centers represent a growing market because of the federal and provincial uh, early learning and child care agreement, which includes commitment to designate up to 20 new early year centers and add 500 new spaces soon, which is, you know, those are big numbers for Prince Edward Island. In comparison, uh, the hospitals on the other end of the spectrum represent, um, you know, we have a, seven hospitals in Prince Edward Island representing about 500 beds or 500 patients that eat, you know, three times a day, multiple snacks. Um, and so that equates to actually roughly the same amount of meals per year around 550,000. Um, but food procurement in the hospitals, that has to follow the provincial procurement regulations. Um, there's a tender process that involves bids submitted to requests from government, and then they have to purchase all the suppliers to the agreed uh, vendor according to the agreed upon price. And so this can be a little bit of that red tape that I talked about. Um, food services overseen by registered dietitians, teams of unionized Red Seal cooks, and work duties for those cooks are outlined in contracts that you know, reflect the collective agreement through the union and the province. And each day's tasks for cooks are, are highly kind of detailed and outlined, and each recipe is standardized uh, to ensure consistency so that positions can be filled seamlessly when cooks are sick or on vacation, and to ensure really critical nutritional consistency um, for clinical implications. Food service supervisors distribute menus to patients days in advance so they can select items that they may desire. And after they're collected back, they're reviewed to ensure those patients are receiving the right, uh, you know, their, their, their correct clinical dietary recommendations. Um, so these logistics for cooking for and feeding hundreds of people simultaneously, um, sometimes several floors away from the kitchen, provide, you know, that, that's way different than uh, cooking for 50 kids. Um, and kind of chucking lunch at them. Um, industrial kitchens equipped with huge ovens, steamers, walk-in fridges and freezers, large prep areas and huge dishwashing areas with dedicated staff and, you know, food safe temperatures. I mean, there, it's critical in all, uh, in, in all the food preparation that we do, but in, in an institution uh, like a hospital setting, um, it's especially critical. Overall, the whole process from procurement to meal de delivery is highly organized and structures with many checks and balances to make sure that food quality and safety is met. So, you know, it's actually potentially kind of an, a, a similar market share in terms of procurement, um, but really different policies, procedures, and requirements. Um, so um, that was just to kind of highlight what it might look like kind of internally. Um, on an end note, you know, we really need to make institutional work program at work for farmers, um, help the profits stay on farms. Um, long term, if we want local food in institutions, we need there to be local food. 
and uh, you need to meet the institutions where they're at, and we need uh, you know those distribution channels to help bridge the communication between supply and demand. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have times for questions, and feel free to target your question to any one of the people. And I think, Josh, you got your hand up first there. Uh, let's wait for the mic. Hey, folks, that was all super interesting. I have a question about the role of um, provincial procurement decision-making and authority. Just uh, so. In Newfoundland right now, we're moving through a social procurement policy development process. It's really exciting. Uh, and our chief procurement officer said to me, actually, the other day, she was asking, you know, what can we do to move the food procurement file forward? Because most of the food procurement, it's governed by the provincial regulations, but it's not, the province isn't doing the procuring. You know, it's happening through the schools or through the individual healthcare institutions. So I'm just curious, like where, where can or should a provincial government sit? Are there things that the province could do to make your lives easier doing procurement in like educational university healthcare settings? I can start. <laughs> Um, it would be really great from a procurement perspective if there was a policy around the local food procurement. So actually saying you must purchase X from local. I think that, that if we had that, that would really remove many of the barriers that we, um, that we face from like trade agreements and all of those things. So that would be the number one thing I would look for. That's not, but I may, I'll just add that when we had EXPA, there was, it wasn't a policy, but there was the 20% target, and that really helped us, you know, even pointing to that to be like, yes, there's a mandate, but a policy would give me, so just to second that. Just a third that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that 20% was extremely helpful. So again, policy um, is a huge support measure, um, and it's something that you can take to your leadership and say, hey, this is what we have to do. It's also the right thing to do. Um, so that, that's a great support as well. And I, I know in our contracts, we've got about 20% of wiggle room. So we try to utilize that 20% and purchase local through that as well. I know this, there's not a lot of information about it um, online yet, but in our next tendering process, Prince Edward Island is going to be have like a 10% price point uh, adjustment for local, like PEI local product, and so that's another helpful thing to help kind of balance out the pricing. That's great, thank you. Um, right here. <clears throat> thank you, um, and sorry I missed your name, but I have a question for the farmed cafeteria. Uh, yeah. Nancy. Nancy, thank you. Um, so I love that this is a thing. I hope that every school uh, can do this, so I guess this my question relates to that. Do you think it's economically sustainable for every school to participate in this? Um, I know you mentioned that these schools are able to participate because of government grants. Are those grants going to be around forever? Are there enough grants for every school to participate? So. So, well, I'd have to defer to Don to give you a solid answer on the sustainability economically, but I do know that the actual lunch program, the kids are paying the $4 most kids are paying $4 for their lunch. And the pay what you can model allows for that. So I believe that that part is at least somewhat sustainable. Um, the other add-ons like the um, you know, hydroponic tower and those things, those are being covered by Farm to Cafeteria Canada, those, those special projects. But the model of the lunch, anybody correct me if I'm wrong because there are other people in the room that know a little bit about this program. I believe that is economically sustainable at this time. Now we do have the benefit of being in the Annapolis Valley, so we have the produce there. So for other schools, you know, maybe it's gonna be difficult to get access to those products and that would maybe be something where we'd be looking for subsidies from, from the government to help with that. Also schools that have fewer children that can pay will need more help with this. This is a, you know, there's pockets all over the province and all over Canada where the schools would have more kids that couldn't pay and that would be a challenge. Yeah, thanks for the question. And if you want more info, I just wanted to mention, Don left me with a whole bunch of handouts, 
with, um, what do you call those little black and white things? QR codes, QR codes <laughs> to give you more information. And her contact info is on those sheets, so right over there below the speaker. So feel free to take one of those. Thanks. That's great. I have a really quick question for Chatty. Uh, who's the food service provider at Acadia University? Uh, currently, we're with Chartwell's Campus Group. Uh, thank you for your presentations. And just going back to procurement, um, I just had a question about, and especially I think you were talking about the Acadia University food vision. And when you talked about procurement, um, to what extent are you looking at uh, the ones you're procuring from uh, and that they also, because you, you talked about the, centering the voices that are around the table that don't have power. There are power dynamics in this whole conversation. So what percentage of those uh, procurement opportunities are coming from diverse groups and farmers who are um, perhaps not in the mainstream? So smallholders, maybe uh, migrant workers, and, and other, just other other diverse um, perspectives. And then because I also I think all of you talked about collaboration and coordination to address the systemic systemic barriers when it comes to uh, the the food system that's that's broken. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I would say we're, it's very much a conversation and a journey to make sure that we are, there's lots of levels of power dynamics that we're navigating and I think that that's, a, yeah, it's an ongoing work. So I would say, it's, you know, I won't say like we're here. Um, the, the, way that this, the way that we're approaching the connections with producers has been very much relational and so those folks who are around us, particularly trying to, to get to smaller producers, producers with diverse voices, um, even I would say that that's a challenge in the Annapolis Valley of having like who's farming and who has access to resources and grants. And so I think it goes down multiple levels. Um, and I would say that that isn't something that, you know, we, there's, we could do more to center that, absolutely. Um, but it is part of the conversation in terms of trying to make sure that we're reaching out and talking to folks. And as I said before, we don't have producers at the table. Um, and that's partly an institutional structure. So we, to include people who are part of the institution requires a different level of, you know, whereas trying to create room for people to be on that committee who are not part of the institution is another further challenge. And so right now it's an indirect relationship. It's ensuring that those of us who are around the table are then reaching out and making sure that we're having those connections and conversations. Um, and one of the things with working, so as I said, we're really, we're starting to work with the farmer's market, but this is a conversation that goes back seven, six, seven, eight years. Um, but what that also allows us is working with community organizations that had then have access to further producers means that we can then access a lot more. And so part of it is finding that, coming moving on to the collaboration piece, is finding those partnerships so that we can access that. But I think, from my perspective at least, I think that's something we have to always hold the question of and ask that question of how are we doing it. So thank you for, thank you for asking that question. I think it's one we have to keep, at the, keep in the center of the conversation. Um, if I could add, I think um, a couple weeks ago we had a minister's conference in Halifax as well from Department of Agriculture, and that was really, um, you know, I learned a lot during that day and uh, met lots of um, different providers that I had no idea were out there. So I think going to things like this and, and just trying to continuously find those relationships, but they're not easy to find, I think, on both sides. So I'm hoping the more we have these things, the more we can be more um, together in trying to figure out how to move forward. If, sorry, can you hear me? Um, if you could just speak briefly about um, kind of any insights that you could offer from the qualitative research that you did as part of the larger kind of Clary work that, that um, we were involved in and with respect um, I guess to just any um, facilitators to um, local procurement in publicly funded institutions and also COVID, if there was anything that kind of came up that was um, surprising. Sure. Um, so yeah, I've actually worked with Dr. Patty Williams um, from Food Arc and Mount St. Vincent. And uh, we conducted a study looking at uh, local food procurement in publicly funded institutions, which I also happen to work in as well. Um, so we looked at it from two different lenses. 
one, <laughs> pre-pandemic, and uh, two, like the impacts of COVID, two, sourcing local food. So what we found with the pandemic was that, uh, and again, these are preliminary findings, what we found was that there was uh, a really urgent call for local food procurement. Um, as we all are very well aware, uh, the supply chain was greatly impacted. There were border closures, transport issues, um, some plants, manufacturing plants closed, and our global supply chain continues to be um, kind of in havoc. And so there was a really big focus on getting a local supply, something that's a little bit more reliable. Um, and as well, um, from all the participants, it was really clear that uh, their focus was to increase local food procurement and uh, the collaboration piece was there as well. So participants included um, institutions, it included producers, it included suppliers, distributors, distributors, excuse me, and policymakers as well. Uh, so we tried to encompass all of those facilitators and all those key players as well. Um, and I believe that Patty actually has a uh, a table for food bark and food arc in the back, and there is a uh, a one pager there as well. Yeah, thanks, Patty. Linda, okay. We have to feed the farmers. One of the things that sometimes gets lost is we start. We're we're looking at this at this point. Uh, we are on the ground with the farmers, and we understand the huge challenges. We're going to hear more about regulations during the day. Um, as a microbiologist, I understand those needs. But I also want us never to lose sight of the fact that, that and, and you're hearing it from Philip and Abra, uh, our farmers um, in Atlantic Canada have not been doing well. So increase our purchases from them, but sensitively knowing <laughs> that they are meeting, they're having to deal with a lot of challenges. And so I just want to make sure that we always keep that front of mind. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Somebody in the back? Uh, I heard you mention numbers there, uh, meeting your sort of your quota of local of 20, 23 percent. Uh, was that a challenge uh, in meeting that? Uh, was it easy? Uh, have you increased that limit? Are you going to go 30%? And I guess what is your definition of local? Uh, is it uh, within the province? Is it within your community? Uh, I've heard uh, in one of the other sessions there, yes, or last evening, talking about uh, looking at local, I think, in Atlantic Canada. So I'm sure where we have our four different provinces, local is probably within the province, but I'm wondering if we should have that discussion of looking at local within Atlantic Canada. And uh, I'm sure there can be guidelines set up. Yeah, I think we're, we're sort of hearing out there that the premiers are starting to talk more what we can do in healthcare, I think, in Atlantic Canada, how we can improve on that. I guess I'm just wondering from the food perspective that if we want to be self-sufficient not uh, and learn from what happened during COVID and not having to depend on other countries, uh, should we look at in Atlantic Canada as local versus just within our own province? Great question. <laughs> um, so I'll touch base on um, just some of the research that I did with Dr. Patty Williams and I know there's probably others that want to chat about this as well. Um, so one of the things that came up in the research was the definition of local. Some of us have various definitions, so that's really key to keep in mind. You know, how do we define it? Um, and there isn't one official uh, definition for local for Nova Scotia or the Maritimes right now. So I can speak for IWK that... Um, we look at Nova Scotia first, and if we can't source in Nova Scotia, we go towards the maritime. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a pronged approach. So we start at the center and we just kind of go out. Um, but you're right, it does sometimes create confusion of 
okay, well, these are my numbers with local, but um, this person here thinks local is Maritimes. This person here thinks it's just Nova Scotia. This person over here thinks it's Canada. So I think that's uh, a great point. We um, at Nova Scotia Health, we look at rings of local as well. And so we do report on um, Nova Scotia local. So our 23% is Nova Scotia. Um, but we do, um, we do track Nova Scotia, Maritimes, Canada, and outside of Canada. And we buy very little, like 2% outside of Canada. Um, so our definition is similarly, it's um, graded, but we use, we've actually used uh, the one that comes from the Association for Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, I think, ASHI. Uh, which defines it as 400 kilometers, which in our case very neatly maps roughly onto, <laughs> onto the province of Nova Scotia. So Nova Scotia first, but using that definition and then moving out to the Maritimes. And um, we are, yeah, I think our numbers now are at 29, we're at about 29%, 29 and a half percent. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to your other part of your question of how hard was it to get to that. Um, and I would say that there are some things that are, that are low-hanging fruit that are being produced that are easy to access and scale. Um, and I think part of it has been really talking with the food service provider about menu adaptation, which many folks talked about, is how do we work with what's available. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, we, we, there are places where we could get hung up on like, well, this recipe calls for red onions, but we have yellow onions available from the local producer, but not red onions. And so is there flexibility to play with, you know, that's actually a fairly large order. And so I think for us, one of the things that's been really useful is sitting down and taking a good look at the procurement data and then being in touch with producers and saying what's available to find kind of those points. And that's what's allowed it to shift. Um, and some of it has been actually really digging down where sometimes we were assuming that because we were buying from a local distributor, it was local. But then when I started to look at the data, I was like, well, only 25% of what we're buying from that local distributor is coming locally. And then they're supplementing at other times of year. Or, um, and so really taking kind of a, you know, you kind of have to follow it through. There's a lot of that following through, which is, I think, partly where we need organizational capacity for someone to spend, spend that time um, and keep finding links. And some of it has been, has taken time. So for a producer, you know, for example, we were working around meat with someone, they had to shift their bur they had to shift the equipment that made the burgers because the cafeteria serves a four ounce burger instead of a six ounce burger and that's an investment for them to buy that new piece of equipment. Well, is there a commitment from the institution to say we're going to buy that makes it worthwhile for the producer to make that switch? So I think the, the sense of continuity or kind of a commitment from both sides has been part for us of meeting that um, percentage. Just a quick clarification on terms. I'm not sure how much Newfoundland exports, but maybe we want to use the term Atlantic and as opposed to maritime so we don't leave Newfoundland out. <laughs> Very good point. We love the Newfies. Good, good point to end on. It's got uh, Josh big smile on his face and I'm sure other Newfoundlanders as well. We, we are out of time um, and uh, we're now going into our first of the topic table sessions.